medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Let's go to Worldometer, take a look at the individual numbers at this point. It looks like the daily new cases in the United States are starting to level off, maybe even reduce a bit. Here we can see a graph of daily new deaths in the United States, and that seems to be going down as well. Kind of a disturbing Nature article that was just published recently looking at the SARS-CoV-2 infection pattern and seems to indicate that it may have another target in the human body, and that is the T lymphocyte, which is very important in the immune system. This article goes through a number of molecular techniques in its communication, its open communication with nature.com. And it talks about how we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is interacting with the ACE2 receptor on the type 2 pneumocytes. But they also showed that in patients with COVID-19, some studies reported that there was lymphocytopenia, basically meaning low white blood cell counts. And part of that white blood cell count are the lymphocytes, specifically the CD4 and CD8 lymphocytes. They also mentioned that this was also a finding in MERS. MERS was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that was seen back in 2012. And in this article, they talked about their molecular techniques that tried to set out and to see whether or not SARS-CoV-2 also infects T cells, resulting in lymphocytopenia. What they were able to show here is with SARS-CoV, which remember is the SARS virus of 2002, and the SARS-CoV-2, which of course is the recent one, 2019 and now 2020, they were able to see whether or not these viruses, which appear as these bright dots in the fluorescent field, were able to infect these cells and fuse with them. And as you can see with SARS-CoV, there was no fusion cells. In other words, there weren't these big blobs of cells that were kind of lighting up. You can see that nothing here of the sort. But when they did it with SARS-CoV-2, they were able to see these blobs of cells where the virus was able to get in. Therefore, they were able to show that the virus was able to fuse with these T lymphocyte type cells and show that the SARS-CoV-2 virus through a spike protein was able to infect and go into these T lymphocytes. The good news, though, is when the SARS-CoV-2 virus infects the T cell via the CD147 protein, the infection is a dead end, and it's known as abortive. On the other hand, when the virus infects the type 2 pneumocyte via the ACE2 receptor, that infection of that cell does lead to replication of the virus. And the protein that the SARS-CoV-2 uses to enter into the T cell is the CD147 that is present on the surface of the T lymphocytes. So some have compared SARS-CoV-2 with HIV in this sense because there are some similarities. SARS-CoV-2 is a RNA virus. So that's RNA inside SARS-CoV-2 here on the left. And it's also an RNA virus in HIV. But let's take a look at the differences between those. Let's first look at HIV. So with HIV, you have an RNA virus. And in this case, it docks with the docking protein CD4, which targets the T cell specifically, in fact, the helper T cells. But in this case, when the virus docks with the protein and comes into the cell, what is released is the RNA. Now the RNA and a couple of other enzymes are used in this infection without getting into too much detail. But there are two proteins that are very important to understand. The first one is something called reverse transcriptase, RT, and another one is called integrase, or I. And what reverse transcriptase does in HIV is it uses the RNA as a template to make a DNA molecule, and then very quickly it will make the other double strand of that DNA molecule. And then what happens is integrase takes this molecule, this double-stranded DNA molecule, which is a copy, essentially, of the RNA from the original HIV, and what does it do is it actually integrates it into the host cell's DNA, and it stays there permanently, so that when this cell divides and divides, 
a copy of the HIV RNA will now be incorporated into its very nucleus. So every single time it divides, the progenitor T cells or the daughter T cells of this division will have that HIV genome in it. And so what can happen is when you have RNA polymerase coming by and reading this off, it will read this area off and it will make new copies of the HIV virus in terms of RNA, which can then be packaged and new virins can be made. So you can see how a HIV infection is going to be incorporated into the very cell. That's different with SARS-CoV-2. With SARS-CoV-2, when there's an infection of the RNA virus, it will dock with a different protein. In this case, it is the CD147. And what will happen here is that the RNA will come into the cell and it will stay there. And if there is another CD147, there will be another virus with a genome and it will dock and another viron will come in and there will be another one. And so what happens is the cell will build up with a bunch of RNA genomes from the SARS-CoV-2. So you can see, interestingly, this cell here is just filled with the virins that shows fusion. So this article shows again how important it is to have a functional and good immune system, especially since this virus seems to be doing a one-two punch on it. We've already shown a couple of times this article from Nature Medicine. This was a patient that was hospitalized in Australia, and they did a very good job looking specifically at the lymphocytes in this patient. And we can see here that in terms of CD8 and CD4 cells, if you look at what is normal in a healthy subject, these were actually a little bit higher and lower respectively in that category, but that this patient seemed to recover and there was a large increase in the number, in this case of CD8 cells, and a large increase here in the number of CD4 cells. That may be the determining factor in whether a patient recovers or not. The other interesting thing I found about this article was it showed when anti-IgG and IgM were increasing in this patient. And you can see here that it was by day nine that the anti-IgM was two plus to three plus, and anti-IgG was already starting to come up by day seven and day eight. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially as we enter into a season of antibody testing. And speaking of improving your immune system, I also wanted to sort of clear up a number of comments and things that I've seen. There seems to be a theory, at least, that sauna baths or hot air can kill the virus. And I don't believe that anyone's making that claim, at least here at MedCram. The claim or the interesting aspect is that heat followed by cold can actually improve immunity, which in turn can help potentially kill viruses and perhaps even COVID-19. There seems to be some discussion of that, even going back a number of years. And I found this article for those who are really interested in this type of research to be a good clearinghouse and discussion of that. And this is from the Business Insider, the article titled, Taking Regular Sauna Seems to Transform Your Health more evidence that there could be a third pillar of physical fitness beyond diet and exercise. And you can see here that they list off that people in Finland regularly take saunas where they go into extremely hot, dry rooms for short periods of time. The more saunas people take, the healthier they seem to be, according to a new medical review. Health benefits include improved heart health, mental health, immune system function, and there's also significant evidence that exposing yourself to cold temperatures improve health as well. And there's actually a number of important and interesting medical articles, and there are links all through this article. And I encourage you to take a look. We'll leave a link to this in the description below. I also wanted you to be aware of some news that's breaking. We talked about ventilators and using one ventilator to ventilate multiple patients and we had talked about how there was a letter from the AARC and a number of other societies that are involved with ventilation. They were concerned that this would not be a good idea because patients would have different size lungs and different compliance 
Well, there was a press release today showing that there is a new device that would allow control over the amount of tidal volume going to specific patients, even though they're hooked up to one ventilator, and that's called a vent multiplexer. And apparently it was successfully deployed at Yale New Haven Hospital for crisis care co-ventilation during this pandemic. And apparently, according to this press release, it was successful. They are still working with the FDA for full approval, but that that work is going through right now as we speak. So we'll see what happens. I think that's interesting. And I wanted you to be aware that we have a free ventilator course on medcram.com. And of course, coming with the operation of a ventilator, you have to be able to know how to interpret blood gases. And we've also made available for free a complete interpretation of arterial blood gas course. You will never need to shy away again from interpreting a arterial blood gas. So join us at medcram.com and thanks for joining us. Please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and hit that bell icon so you can get notified when we release the new video.